So greetings, uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Chris Benjamin. I am the managing editor of Atlantic Books Today. Uh, and you are viewing a video of the uh, Read Atlantic Voices campaign. And we are featuring uh, some really excellent black writers um, or Africadian writers uh, as, as they are often called. Um, and we wanted to highlight and amplify these important voices and have these important conversations. And we're very lucky to have Sylvia Paris Drummond, CEO of the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute, um, participating with us and conducting some excellent interviews. And today uh, she will be interviewing a uh, poet, playwright, um, and former parliamentarian uh, poet laureate, George Elliott Clark. And we're very thrilled to have both of you here today. So I will just say welcome and then hand it over to Sylvia. Thanks, uh, Chris, and thanks again for this Voices Project. We're, we're, as I've said, we're so excited to be able to share first-person voice of authors and poets, uh, in this case today, and, um, and to have that not just be seen locally, but, you know, uh, as widespread as somebody is when they go online. So thank you for that. Uh, and welcome, welcome to our Institute friend, our family friend, our community friend, uh, you know, the, the, the promoter of all that is amazing here in Nova Scotia and beyond, George Elliott Clark. Thank you, George, for joining us. Thank you for enthusiastically saying yes to, uh, to the request and the reach out. So welcome. Thank you, Sylvia and Chris. Thank you. Okay. Right. So um, I, um, I think it would be most appropriate <laughs> for me to, to say and to acknowledge like your, your storytelling way and your way engaging um, um, with issues is, is you know, uh, well known. And I think uh, what I would like to do is to, just to start with inviting you just to kind of speak to that, like to maybe speak about yourself a bit more than what we've said, um, talk about your journey in regards to, 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 uh, to where you are now in terms of your work, wide open there for you, so please. Sylvia, there's a lot uh, to cover, I gotta say. Um, I was born in 1960, so I'm 60 years old this year, uh, 2020. And, and uh, I was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia, but grew up in Halifax in the North End, which of course is the uh, part of the city most historically associated with the Black community, African Nova Scotians, and the historical African Nova Scotian community, which I sometimes call Afrikanian. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, uh, the older I've become, the more mature I hope I've become, the more I recognize how deeply my growing up in Nova Scotia and specifically in the black community um, as a, a child of the church, although not yet until last year, a member of the church, mm -hmm. um, uh, that is say the African Baptist Association and, and growing up also in a working class community. I mean, that's really important. We don't often talk about class. We often focus on race and racial differences. But part of the racial difference for ourselves as Black Nova Scotians, as African Nova Scotians, as Africadians, is that we also historically were relegated to a position of poverty, a position of illiteracy, and a position of unskilled labor. And so we could be discriminated against, not just because of our race or color, but also because of the fact that we didn't have as much education, we came from poor backgrounds, and we didn't have uh, the requisite skills to get ahead uh, in the economy. Uh, when I was growing up in the 1960s, all of that was just beginning to change, thanks to the protests and upward uh, insurgency of, of, uh, of community leaders uh, like the Olivers, uh, Rocky and Joan Jones and, and others who helped to push our community forward and push the entire province forward but I'm taking a long time to say something very simple, which is that all of that history has inspired me. 
Um, and the older I get, as, I, as I've been saying, the more I come to appreciate that background and that history, which has given me, I hope, a firm uh, way to understand our world, our, our country, uh, uh, Nova Scotia, our community, uh, all of the problems and all the benefits of being where we are. And, and for me, growing up here, um, I did live a few years in the United States, and I'm very thankful for that, uh, both in Durham, North Carolina, and, and in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm definitely very appreciative of those experiences, but I'm still African-Canadian. And I, mm -hmm. and I need to talk about what that really means, especially coming from Nova Scotia and the historical Nova Scotian community, going back on my, on my mom's side to the uh, 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 Black refugees, War of 1812, and on my father's side uh, much later uh, to uh, the arrival of William Andrew White to Nova Scotia in uh, the uh, 1890s, so the late uh, 19th century on my father's side. I also have, like many of us, Indigenous connections, mm -hmm. which mean that my roots in Nova Scotia go all the way back to whatever. On my, on my, on my mom's side, Cherokee, uh, and the Cherokee were allied with, with Black people during the War of 1812. And so when the Black refugees came to, came to uh, Nova Scotia, Cherokee came right along with them because they were allies of the British in fighting the Americans. Um, and foreign families and so on. I don't care if anybody doesn't like it. It's just, it's true. It happened. Uh, and same thing on the Mi'kmaq side. On the Indigenous people in Nova Scotia, I have a connection on my father's side going back to the whites and the olivers and, and so on. And again, if anybody's upset about that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not even gonna say I'm sorry, it's just what it is. It just is what it is. Uh, but coming back to my own boyhood and formative years, uh, uh, again, growing up in 1960s, a time of ferment, a time of great change. Uh, even though I was a child, I was aware of Malcolm X, I was aware of Martin Luther King, I was aware of, uh, of the civil rights movement. I was aware of Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I was aware of the Beatles. I was aware of Bob Dylan. <laughs> I was aware of the Black Panthers. I was aware of second wave feminism by the late 1960s. Uh, but at the same time, I was growing up in a city that was still really kind of segregated, uh, politely segregated. I was growing up in, in a city that had very clear ideas about the position of Black people in the economy. Uh, and I was reminded every now and then uh, in school and even outside of school about where we people belong, where you people belong. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, by the time I was a teenager, I was really conscious of, it, really conscious of, it. and and beginning to form my my political and artistic uh, beliefs and practices in re in reaction to this feeling of being an outsider and of uh, and of being politely oppressed. Uh, which is actually one of the worst kinds of oppression. To be politely oppressed is worse than being than being violently oppressed. Because when you're politely oppressed, you don't even know sometimes that you are actually being discriminated against and being marginalized and being held down. Mm -hmm. And then people smile at you and then make sure you do not get certain benefits, do not get certain opportunities, and so on. So it's the worst kind of racism, really. Uh, uh, the good Canadian kind is the worst kind. You might live through it, but you're going to have... Um, fewer opportunities perhaps, and a more restricted life perhaps, and, and not be easily able to identify uh, what's going on, unless you of course have studies and, and so on. But it still take a long time to say something very simple, which is that I'm really glad I grew up in a community uh, that was so focused on song and music and speech and the delight in talk, and the delight in chat, and delight in gossip. I remember as a boy going up the Three Mile Plain, uh, Newport Station with my mom, and sitting with uh, her, uh, the late Geraldine Clark, and her sister, uh, my aunt Joan Mendes, and my late grandmother, uh, Jean Johnson. And actually, I can't, I can't say I was sitting with them. I would, they, the three of them, would sit around the kitchen table, and they would be talking about stuff going on in the community about who was doing what with whom and so on, and a lot of like untoward activities, which I couldn't understand as a boy. But what I could understand, I would hide. I would, I would sit around the corner from the kitchen on the, on the steps going up to the upstairs. On the, Are you on saying the you, were, were you were eavesdropping? 
I was eavesdropping <laughs> because, you know, I hear my mom talk, I hear my aunt talk, I hear my grandmother talk, but when the three of them, these three black, brown women were sitting around that kitchen table with their tea and whatever, talking, the laughter, Sylvia, the laughter was criminal. Mm. The laughter would smack you down. The laughter was like thunder rolling through the house, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as a boy, I'm sitting up there on the steps listening. I don't understand anything they're talking about, but that laughter was outrageous. It was outrageous, not lifting. It's kind of laugh, makes your belly shake, and tears come out your eyes. And, and, uh, and I, again, I wouldn't understand the content of the gossip, but I, I just, but it was still, it was still enjoyable uh, mm -hmm. to eavesdrop on those conversations and, and that laughter. And then, you know, go in the school ground, play playgrounds, uh, with the kids, black, white, brown, red, yellow, immigrant children, and, and so on, along with working class kids, uh, the sailors' kids, and so on from the Royal Canadian Navy, and and uh, they're playing. We're all playing together. They're cussing. They are cussing something terrible, which of course I could not do because my father and my mother were very strict on my on my two brothers and I. So there was no cussing coming from us, but we couldn't help but hear it. We couldn't help but hear it, so I had all this laughter uh, from from my mom and 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 those relatives, my mom's side family. Then we had all the cussing in the schoolyard, and all the ebonics, all the black talk, uh, all the raps, uh, and so on. And not to mention the fact that we were also as boys. I remember Gilbert Day, Mark Day, uh, and and my brothers and some other kids uh, uh, from the community, from the hood. Uh, North End, Halifax, Maynard, Creighton, Garish, Canard, Agricola, and so on. We get together. We we form little bands. Mm -hmm. We have little we have little singing groups. Uh, now I'm I was told I couldn't sing, but that didn't matter. I was still singing anyway. And we would put together we would put together uh, garbage can lids and pieces of wood, and 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 we'd sit out there on the sidewalk and we'd be beating on the garbage cans and beating on the garbage can lids and on the pieces of wood. And we've been making up the best kinds of songs, best kinds mm -hmm. of songs. And when I was a little bit older, you know, 12, 13, uh, my brothers uh, and I would stand under the windows of girls uh, in the hood that we kind of liked but couldn't really, were too shy to say anything. And we'd sing. We'd sing to them up in their windows, up in their bedroom windows until their parents came out. Or our parents came out and said, Doc, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so, you know, George, I, you're really speaking to our memories, right? I think, you know, when, when folks hear this, folks from here down home, but across, they're going to be like, yeah, I, re I remember those things. And I'm, I'm, I particularly want to make a connection to what I hear you saying about the importance of knowing our history of knowing our family connections, right? And how, how that is a passion into story, right? Uh, and it's something that to be able to be able to build from in terms of the connections, passion. And I also, I think I also hear in what you're saying, um, an opportunity in terms of role models, right? And, and mentors and, and how they can kind of show up in different ways. And, I don't know if you want to make a little bit of a connection for that to, to that the influence of that in your writing or even in your choice of career uh, in that regard. Well, Sylvia, so, yeah, that's a big question again, and thank you so very much. Uh, uh, when I was twelve, I went down. Uh, my parents sent me down to uh, what was then Koala Street Baptist Church, New Horizons Baptist Church, to join the choir. That was a Friday night, nineteen seventy-two. And the choir director, uh, Ms. Diane Mack, sent me back home the same night, said I couldn't sing. And so then I felt really deflated that I couldn't sing, right? So um, I decided that what I should try to do is write songs. So I like music, but I couldn't sing. So I figured I should try to write songs. And so when I was 15, I, I, I made it a point to try to write four songs every day. I didn't always have music, but I would, I, I, didn't always have a tune in mind, but I would write something that looked like a song. And then I started taking books out of the North End Library in Halifax about how to be a good songwriter. And all these books kept saying, you got to be like Bob Dylan. 
you got to be able to 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 write poetic. You got to be able to write poetry. So then I started to take out books on writing poetry in order to become a better songwriter. And I'm really happy about that. That my um, uh, uh, education as a poet began with trying to be a songwriter, and 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 I'm still happy about that. And as you probably know, I've had a few operas produced and I've, I've had a few songs recorded and so on. No number one hits, I'm afraid to say, no number one hits, but I'm really glad that I had that in my background. Mm -hmm. And then to become a better poet, uh, I decided I should go to university, but I was really pushed to go to university by Rocky and Joan Jones, by Jackie Barkley, social worker in Halifax, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sylvia mm -hmm. Hamilton, Bev Greenlaw. These were the people who, who really pushed me and said, you gotta go, you have to go to university and so on. So I was, I was afraid, I was 18. I didn't have any money really. I was fearful about going to university. I didn't think I could survive. Uh, but Joan Jones gave me a job and Rocky told me, you're gonna go to the University of Waterloo. <laughs> 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 so that's where I went to study. I was supposed to go and study black history uh, with Jim Walker, the great Jim Walker uh -huh. uh, historian yeah. and a good friend of Rocky's and Jones. Um, but, uh, when I got to Waterloo, I was in co I got, I got into English, co-op English, and it meant I couldn't be on campus to take any courses with Jim. But here's the good thing. I was so homesick for Nova Scotia. I couldn't believe I was so homesick when I got there, uh, night, fall 1979, 19 years old. My first time really to leave the province for a good long time, right? And, and I was, I was incredibly homesick. So you know what I did? I went into the Dana Porter Arts Library, uh, six, seventh uh, floors, where they have all the books on sociology and history and social work. And I read, I think I read every single book they had on Black Nova Scotia as of 1979. Every single book, every single study. So that's how I'd already had some immersion in African history, Black Nova Scotian history, the Loyalists, the refugees, the Maroons, and so on. But uh, because of my homesickness, I just dove right into all that material that was sitting up there, probably thanks to Jim Walker, in the in the library at the University of Waterloo. And and I started to write poetry about being a Black Nova Scotian, mm -hmm. about my experiences, about Godigan Street, about mm -hmm. Mainer Street, about people I knew, and their voices and so on started to come into my poetry, started to become... And at first I, I thought, this can't be very good, but who's going to care about got against street. Who's going to care about Agricola? Who's going to care about uh, Weymouth Falls and and uh, uh, Three Mile Plains and East Preston, North Preston, uh, 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 Lucasville, Upper Hamlet Plains, and so on. But as I, as I dug into this history, and especially history of the church, the colored Baptist in Nova Scotia, Peter E. McHero, 1895, I began to see stories, great mm -hmm. stories, like Reverend F.R. Langford trying to fly to heaven with wings he made out of sheepskin. He didn't make it. <laughs> Aspirations are so important. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are important. The, 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 the spirit was willing, but the wings were weak. Uh, let me put it that way. So down he went. Uh, but still, he uplifted the community with that attempted miracle, but there was a subsidiary miracle of bringing the people together. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to heal the rift in the, in the ABA uh, back in the late 19th century. And, and the stories of Father Preston riding his horse all up and down mainland Nova Scotia uh, through blizzard and, of, of course, rain and, and heat uh, and, and building all these churches. You know, I think that was mm -hmm. a great feat. A couple dozen churches all around mainland Nova Scotia. Basically, the people built them themselves. There was very little assistance from anybody. And so these were poor people, and yet the, uh, as a testament to their faith, put these churches up. And yet people writing poetry, um, and you have, the, of course, uh, people going out to box the pugilists, uh, uh, of course, Sam Langford and George mm -hmm. Dixon, uh, and not to mention later on the Downies and Buddy Day and, and, and so on. Also really important personages, pugilists, preachers, teachers, and so on. And I began to see, and social workers can't leave them out, can't leave them out. They also become a very important, and I also got to put a word in for the lawyers. I know, I know, but you got to put a word in for the lawyers too, uh, despite sometimes um, having difficult relations at times. 
uh, with the legal community, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. they're also very important for our community. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here, and put it, bring it all together, is that um, no one should ever think that their stories don't matter. Mm -hmm. No one should ever believe that they don't have a history or a genealogy or ancestors worth talking about. Because mm -hmm. really, ultimately, um, the human experience is the same everywhere. Because everybody's been oppressed at one point or another. Everybody. By somebody. Everybody's been oppressed at one point or another in global human history. We've all had struggles as human beings. We've all had struggles for liberty and equality uh, and so on. But we've also had the, the struggles of of earning a living, of, of building a home, finding a homeland, uh, mm -hmm. of, of uh, raising children, uh, taking care of the sick, uh, um, taking care of those who, who uh, have been imprisoned and, and, so, and healing and trying to heal um, and to do good as well as, as, well as to punish um, uh, the most grievous infractions. And that's been, Common, not to mention culture. I mean, song and dance and and plays and performance of one sort or another, uh, including church worship and performance as means of establishing community. So the Africadian, African Nova Scotian, Black Nova Scotian historical experience is the human experience, but through us. Mm -hmm. It's the human. It's the whole human experience, but through ourselves, with our own language, our own talk. I'm not a very good example of it because I got, I got too much ivory tower behind me. But I grew up with African Nova Scotia vernacular English, mm -hmm. and it does exist. It's a distinct form of English. It's not the same as African American English. It's not the same as West Indian English. It is our own, which developed over 250, 300 years of being separated from uh, the United States, from where uh, many of us arose. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and being exposed to British English, Scottish uh, speech, um, uh, British speech in in general, uh, as well as uh, the influences, some influences from the West Indies through maritime trade, molasses uh, uh, coming in and and salt cod going out. Uh, <laughs> so we got those. Oh random. come on! You make me nostalgic. Codfish, <laughs> cream. Blue and, potatoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I love the food, too, and I miss the food. Green tomato chow chow. Green mm. tomato chow chow. You know, you can only find it in one place. They may call it something else elsewhere, but I grew up with that. Scotian gold. Uh, graves. Um, and not to mention the, the regulation fish and chips, salt and vinegar, uh, and, and so on. And, and pound cake. Holy smokes. Um, I can go on and on and on. I'm, 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 I miss the food. I, I miss the bone ears. Yeah. <laughs> what I about the blueberries the and the blueberries? <laughs> oh, yeah, blueberries, strawberries, yeah. <laughs> raspberries, blackberries, all, all the that, berries, yeah. hazelnuts. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so where I was going in terms of like talking about the connection of food and culture and art, and your works, as you've acknowledged, like have shown up in various ways. Like I said, we've had the, we've had the, honor and the pleasure, Dr. Clark, of having you here at our site and having you here at home in community and sharing readings and, um, and, and, and talking about those experiences. And so, so, so one of the things that we'll have, hope will happen from this series is that folks will be encouraged, as you've already mentioned, like to, that to know that they have a story to tell and to share that story. And, whether they the the format that they choose to to share it uh, will be up in theirs and we've got with technology kind of different ways of doing it but i did want to kind of make an acknowledgement of some of the 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 pieces um that pieces that maybe you could speak to a little bit in terms of what have stories that were um uh, filmed um i don't know if this is going to be able to show up but some of the draw for you've drawn for some stuff i remember when we were together here in Halifax and we had this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Talk about for us, right? The family connection. This is a, another amazing resource, a collection, a story of telling, right? Um, and I think I must have loaned uh, the the one two of your poetry books. One I was looking for this morning on my shelf and I can't find it. But I tend to loan these things out, but 
I, I found this in the look, <laughs> you know, as well in terms of the work. So I don't know if you wanted to like make kind of any comment on some of the work and, and ones that um, um, I think in two aspects, maybe that were, you know, kind of seminal for you, pivot points for you, um, and ones that you might see now in terms of where we are currently and what we're talking about in terms of Black Lives Matters, because um, I want to cue you up because where we're going to go before we leave is for you to be maybe suggesting to folks what would be a call to action um, based on kind of hearing this conversation. So, so yeah, so let's, so let me let you in. <laughs> Sylvia, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for holding up those books. I'm going to hold up uh, Wild Falls, uh -huh. which okay. is, which is 30 years old this year, came out in 1990. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's probably my best known book. It certainly has sold mm -hmm. a whole lot of copies. And uh, there's a movie that Clement Virgo directed, One Heart Broken Into Song, that's based in part on this on this story. Uh, and and uh, I want to I want to reference Wild Falls because of the it's my second book of poetry, my second book in in general. Uh, but uh, the reason I want to reference this is because. I published my first book when I was 23, 1983, but I didn't know what I was doing. I just put together a book because Leslie Choice asked me to, um, publisher of Potter's Field Press. And so he approached me and asked me, he said, you got a manuscript? And I said, no. And he said, well, send me a bunch of poems and I'll publish them. It took me a year to do it. I finally did. And the book came out and I'm very thankful for it. 1983, all of a sudden I'm an author. All of a sudden I'm a published poet uh, with a book. For crying out loud, it was it was exciting and, and so on, but I really didn't have a clue what I was doing or what I was trying to say as a as a writer, as an author, as a poet. But for Wild Falls, I had the experience of working as a social worker for uh, the Black United Front, uh, and I was based in Sector Two, the Annapolis Valley. So I had my responsibility was all the Black communities from basically. Uh, Windsor Plains down to Weymouth Falls. And the year I worked there, 1985, I had just come back from Waterloo with my honors BA in English and a year as a newspaper editor, student newspaper editor. And I had studied a whole lot of Shakespeare and read a whole lot of British literature. And then all of a sudden I'm back in Black Nova Scotia, in rural Nova Scotia, hearing all these voices around me that I had heard growing up, but hadn't really, really listened to. But now I've got this, I've got an honors BA in English. I'm a scholar. So I, now I'm hearing these voices and I'm hearing the black English, the black Nova Scotian talk, and it sounds Shakespearean. It sounds rich. It, it's, and so then I began to write poems based on my understanding, my new understanding of our own talk, our own voices, and our stories. And through that year as a social worker, I heard a lot of stories. And I began, including stories about injustice, uh, including the story of, of the death of, of Graham Norman Cromwell Jarvis in June 1985, and the, and the uh, belief of many of us that his death was a murder. Uh, and that uh, his killer was acquitted by an all-white jury. And, and it had all kinds of reverberations for the entire Black community all throughout the province. And I was one of the people who was trying to get an, uh, trying to get an appeal of the acquittal, uh, which happened in that case. We were unsuccessful in, in achieving that. But in the process of doing that social work, I also really got influenced powerfully by the voices of the people around me. And if I may, I'd like to just share um, one, one little uh, poem, maybe two little poems, uh, if I'm allowed, uh, from Wild of Falls, just to give a, a sense of the flavor of how things started to work for me. So this is a poem called The Wisdom of Shelley. And I always say, I try to do it in her voice as I, as I imagine it, um, uh, or as I, as I hear it. But uh, anyway, uh, so this is her response to my character X, who's trying to woo her. He's trying to win her heart with all of this fancy talk and so on. But she is resistant because of the difficult life she's had already. 
And so this is her response to X, the wisdom of Shelley. And she says, you come down after five winters, X, bristling with roses and words, 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 brazen as brass. Like a late blizzard, you bust in our door, talking April and snow and rain, littering the table with poems, as if we could trust them. I can't. I heard Pa tell Ma how much and much he loved, loved, loved her. And I saw his fist fall so gracefully against her cheek. She swooned. Roses got thorns, and words do lie. I've seen love die. So that's uh, uh, my access to Africadian voice, Africadian English. And I'm going to do one more. I hope that's okay. This is, uh, I remember writing this poem, which is actually a song. I wrote this when I was 19 on the Dartmouth Ferry, crossing over to Dartmouth from Halifax, foggy night. And I'm sitting there and I write this and it's King Bee Blues. It's so it's supposed to be a blues song. 1930s is the, is the time frame here, but here it is. I'm an old king bee, honey, a buzzing from flower to flower. I'm an old king bee, sweet, a humming from flower to flower. Women got good pollen, mm, I get some every hour. There's lily in the valley, and sweet honeysuckle rose too. There is lily in the valley, and sweet honeysuckle rose too. And there's pretty black-eyed Susan, <clears throat> a perfect as the night is blue. Now, you don't have to trust a single black word I say. Now, you don't have to trust a single black word I say. But don't be surprised if I sting your flower today. But don't be surprised if I sting your flower today. Right. <laughs> so I had a, a lot of inspiration, a lot of fun, just digging into the oh, culture. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sonia. <laughs> I was just digging into the culture to put together Wild Falls. And the, it's full of photographs. Mm -hmm which I found in the uh, public archives, particularly of uh, Black women, Black Nova Scotian women. Uh, and I thought that was really important. Here's, a, here's a, a, another one. So, you know, this is a book of poetry, but it's also doing social work. It's also mm -hmm. doing history. And you know, something I'd like to share with, with everybody, a couple of points I need to make real fast. In my opinion, and I believe this to be true. Every writer, I don't care what your education background is, every writer is an intellectual. Get used to it. Every writer is an intellectual. Embrace it. Don't be, don't be afraid. Embrace that identity. You're an intellectual. You write, you're an intellectual. You are thinking about words. You are thinking through language. When you are creating whatever it is you want to create. I don't care how funky it is. You are a funky intellectual. Doesn't matter. You're a funky intellectual. Make it funky. It's still got to be intellectual if you are writing. And that includes writing songs. That includes writing rap, for crying out loud. Rap is full of social commentary, history. I'm thinking of Beyonce and her, and her current song about Black history and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you cannot write that kind of stuff unless you have some kind of knowledge base, unless you have done some thinking. No matter how danceable the song is, there's still thought that's going into it. You're still an intellectual writing songs for crying out loud. And you've and you got to keep that in mind. Uh, and, that, and that has to do with activism as well. Um, I personally believe that you don't have to write about politics if you don't want to. I believe that freedom of speech means that you have freedom to write what you want to write, say what you want to say. You don't have to be didactic. You don't have to be pedantic. You don't have to try to teach or preach to anybody. You can just write to have fun. You can just write what you, what you think and it can only be about butterflies and, and, and uh, uh, horses or whatever. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. At the same time, that's true. If you want to comment on history and politics and society, you got to feel absolutely free to do so. And either do it directly or indirectly through narrative and metaphor or through expository prose. 
to say exactly what it is that, that you need to say as clearly as you can. Uh, a little more uh, James Baldwin, a little less Beyonce, maybe. It's one way to, <laughs> one way to think of voting, right? Um, and, and, or a little more Beyonce, a little less James Baldwin, whatever you want to play it, it it's mm -hmm. okay. So long mm -hmm. as you are telling what you know to be true. So long as you are saying what you know to be true. And there's mm -hmm. no point in, in not saying what you think is going to be true, what you think is true, because everybody's going to know what you really think anyway. Once they read your text, they're going to know what you really mm -hmm. think. You might think to yourself that, oh, I'm going to hide what I think. I'm going to hide what I believe. Too late. So not, it's a problem. As soon as you put that book or that poem or that play or that screenplay out there, all, everything you believe, everything you think is right there. And you can say, no, no, it's the character. It's the character. It's the villain speaking. It's not me. Yes, it's you. <laughs> Just get used to it. I understand. You want to tell people, no, I don't really think that. I don't believe that. It's okay. We all got to do it. We all got to make those, we all got to say those things. It's all right. But uh, God knows what's true and good critics will know what is true. Uh, no matter what you think. And in fact, if you're not understanding your own soul, if you're not in tune with what you truly believe, then you're just lying to yourself uh, when you try to write. So you may as well get, get happy and get comfortable with saying what you think, even if you are using characters and, and narrative and making stuff up. Uh, mm -hmm. to create your world. Um, there's an American writer who said, I forget her name, but she said, you live your life and you write your philosophy. And I should really remember her name. I suppose we can Google it and find, and find out who she was, uh, who she is. I think she might have passed on, but in any event, that one sentence by her, uh, this American woman writer has been, and shame on me for not remembering her name immediately, because I think that that sentence is so crucial to every writer. You live your life and you write your philosophy. Whatever you believe in your heart is what's going to come out with what you write. So you may as well be aware of it. You may as well be conscious of what you really think and then be able to explore those ideas in whatever it is you put out there. So, um, yeah, yeah so no, that's I'm I feel like like there's jumping around. <laughs> yeah. Well, there feels like there's advice in there about uh, kind of self um, Self-knowledge, self-reflection, trusting self. Um, I feel like those are things that, to me, that has our connection with kind of this, uh, um, I guess, call to action piece. Like if, if you've encouraged folks to, if you are interested, take it up, give it a try. Uh, you're probably going to want to come from knowing yourself. Uh, and that can show up like either way. It's, it's um, you know, uh, various forms i think i've heard you say in terms of inviting people just to just to give give it a go right if you're interested give it a go so i i kind of um I appreciate that uh, in terms of inviting folks into this writing world um uh, i don't know george if there's any other things that you think like uh you want to leave in terms of a message um i i do want to say again like how here at the uh institute at the Delmar body Day learning institute you know, um, that the resources that you've had, uh, others, uh, there's this theme that we continue to encourage, which is trust your voice, which is know your history, which is share that proudly, which is have pride in self. So, so thank you for sharing those pieces in this conversation um, and also for, for the engaging way uh, that you that you that you share those messages and tell stories. So, but I do want to, yeah, invite you. If there's any other pieces you want to share with us, any other comments? Uh, Sylvia, yes. <laughs> I just want to come back to the, my my statement, my argument, my belief that every writer is an intellectual, and what that also means is that is that you are a conscious uh citizen you are a conscious person which means that you are likely conscious about social justice issues it doesn't mean you have to comment on it but it does mean that if you do choose to go in that direction it is uh an important responsibility that you may choose to take up uh and and uh and and i should also say in relation to this that in terms of black lives matter Every story we tell, every poem we write, every song that we, that we sing that 
that comes out of ourselves, that comes out of our community is saying Black Lives Matter. It's mm -hmm. saying my aunt matters, saying my uncle matters, my father matters. The motorcyclist is based on my late father's diary, 1959, mm -hmm. when he was unsure about his uh, romantic future and, and was uh, uh, utilizing his motorcycle as a means to cycle around uh, various communities and offer rides to various um, uh, young ladies at the time, uh, including eventually my mom. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, when I read his diary, uh, Bill Clark, my late father, I read his diary, I was blown away that, that uh, he was so vulnerable and so open. So even my father's story, as it turns out, for me was very inspirational, trying to understand this young man in the, in the uh, late 1950s. And, uh, uh, and again, saying that his life matters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my mom's life matters. My brother's, my sister's lives matter, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And not just the historical persons, but I should, I should hold up another book here, uh, which is mm -hmm. uh, my latest, uh, Portia White, Her History, A Portrait in Words, uh, uh, published by Nimbus. And, and uh, I had a lot of fun writing this and I had to do it because I kept getting sore throats. And I think that was my great aunt Portia White telling me to, to get on with it and get her, get her story <laughs> told. Um, and, and I told it in rhyme, eight syllable uh, rhymes, uh, rhyming lines, uh, couplets, octosyllabic couplets to be, to be uh, precise. Uh, and, and uh, I should have um, uh, a part uh, picked out to, to read. Um, okay, let me see here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and all right, well, just this little, this little part. Um, I, Portia May White, born on June 24, 1911, one of 13, but Shakespearean. Dubbed for Wills, Lawyer, Heroine, and Lagoon Gondola of Venice. That Merchant of Venice Princess, the third child of Isidora and William Andrew White Bora, would open for me so many I read coins the plural penny. Let conductors posture or pose batons that argue cons and pros of music versus rest, silence versus clamor, the wild violins of lilting halls, tilting stages, sopranos vamping outrageous while contraltos conquer tenors. A singers at home with dancers or actors and musicians at curtain where goes round a dark hat for change while, cla while clapping crowds apply, echo of each expensive cry purchased by ticket, paid attention, no deficit may I mention. Applause rings cheap but very rich that noise is rushing the airs, which is lush reward for brass flash words, brandish, bandy, like clashing swords. Um, I could go on. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, just telling her story. Yeah. And I think it's, you know what? I think it's so appropriate that we're closing this uh, conversation in the way that it began. Your interest was to be a musician, right? <laughs> to be a singer. <laughs> and we're closing with the inspiration from an amazing singer, opera singer, whatever, right? So, and teacher, of course, as well, was her another career. But yeah, thank you so much, George, for this conversation and this time. And Dr. George Elliott Clark, we look forward to you having the opportunity to come home soon. Thank you, Sylvia. But I gotta, I gotta read one last piece. See, you can't keep a, you can't keep a poet down who's trying to sing. But I want to, I want to read one more piece from While It Falls, just because of the fact that these have been difficult days for us all uh, this year, 2020. Um, and and I mean for this to be inspirational for everybody. And I wrote it for for exactly that reason. And it's everything is free. And there's also a musical version of this by. Uh, the Ottawa-based folk singer Susan O. Susan Odle, O-D-L-E. So if you look her up, you can find her album. And, and um, uh, I think it's online, uh, this song, Everything is Free. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to speak it. Here it is. Everything is free. Wipe away tears. Set free your fears. Everything is free. 
Only the lonely need much money. Everything is free. Don't try to find the love you find. Everyone is free. Your lovers, yours, surrender, force, everyone is free. The sun melts down, spreads gold around. Everything is free. The rain is spent lending flowers scent. Everything is free. The love you live, the life you give, everything is free. Everything is free. <laughs> Thank you so much, George. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Have an awesome day. Thank you again. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, George. That was amazing. <laughs> Best wish to stay healthy. You too. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye.